Uh, my name is Derek Wheelan. Uh, on behalf of Randy Anderson, who I think everybody probably met as they were driving over there, uh, Steve Myers, Doug Dreyer, uh, we uh, came up with a crazy idea to uh, host a 50th anniversary event here, uh, recognizing that there's a lot of history here, even though this track is only open for a very short period of time. Uh, but we want to capture that information. So by show of hands here, how many people who weren't actually attended a race, a race here at Greenwood? So thank you guys very much for coming out today. Um, as you guys can see, we've got some memorabilia here. Uh, we, this is the first of, of three seminars we're going to talk about uh, the design and the building of the track here a little bit and uh, some of the buildings here. And then we'll talk about some the corner workers, uh, people that worked here uh, during the races, speak a little bit, and we had a chance to drivers that raced here. So, again, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, the, the turnout for this was amazing. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Will Dykes. I'm trying to. <laughs> Thanks for that great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, Eric and I are uh, on some other commissions together, so uh, we know each other pretty well. But, uh, I'm an architect. Uh, I went to Iowa State University and in a time frame which makes sense with this Greenwood Roadway, which is why I'm here to talk to you about that today. Um, I'm semi-retired now, but my firm was variously known as uh, Wilkins Bassard Dicus, uh, Bassard Dicus Associates, and RDG Bassard Dicus. Now it's RDG Planning and Design. Um, we grew from three to about 200 people by the time that I retired, and some of the more prominent uh, projects that we did uh, include the uh, restoration of Iowa State Capitol from 1981 to continuing today, uh, and, a lot, and hundreds of other projects as well. But <coughs> what I'm here to talk to you about today, can you hear me in the back? Okay, okay, good. Uh, was that during my time at Iowa State, which, which uh, the architecture is a five year degree. A professional degree, and I was there from 1959 to graduating in 1964. Uh, when you get to the fifth year in architecture, you have to select a project to do a one year long project, so it's called a, a fifth year thesis, and that's uh, what I'm going to talk about and show you today. And I had grown up in Michigan uh, loving cars, as everybody here probably did. Uh, and uh, certainly wanted to be a sports car racer at some point. I never managed to, uh, to get that far, but I do remember riding my bicycle to downtown Muskegon, Michigan and when I was about 11 years old and sitting in a brand new MGTD on the floor and say, telling the salesman I was gonna, I was gonna own one of those. <laughs> Didn't manage that either, but I did have an MGB and an Austin Healey and uh, I drive the street version of this car and it's on the screen now. Um, I also was uh, wanting at that time there was in, in my high school years there was something called the Fisher Body Craftsman Guild that General Motors put on maybe some of you participated in, in, uh, involved uh, designing a car and building a model uh, uh, I never had enough know how to actually enter that but I, I was entranced by it I wanted to be a car designer in, in those years did research on it found out that you, had, you know, about the only way to do that would be to go to the Art Center of Los Angeles which, uh, being a uh, young man from uh, Michigan, Illinois, and Minnesota, and Iowa, I, I, that was beyond me to think that uh, that was something I wanted to do. So I researched the design fields and decided to become an architect uh, in the eighth grade, I figured out when I looked back on that. And I've never uh, regretted doing that, although I still love automobile design. Um, the only races that I had been to by the time I got to that fifth year in in college was the midgets running the Illinois State Fair Como, uh, going to Lake Como, uh, Minnesota to see uh, ice racing with sports cars and then in the summer of 63 before I began this project I spent the year in England uh, or the summer in England working for an architect's office and I bought a BSA Bantam, the 1951 BSA Bantam for $35 uh, drove it all around southern England where I was, including the Brands Hatch, which was only the track, which was only about 10 miles from where I was living with the family at that time, and could see, you know, practice going on at that time. For I saw motorcycle start car racing, which scared the hell out of me. Those people laying out like a sailboat uh, in the auxiliary seat, and uh, then some. Uh, we have to be up with Ray Phillips, who was another uh, activist of the, uh, and I think Ray's got some 
relatives here as well. Um, and I interviewed those two fellows and they, they sort of steered me and kind of became my clients for the theoretical project that was the student project uh, that I went through. Uh, by the way, I sold the BSA banner for 20 bucks when I left. The <laughs> I wish I could have brought it back. It would have been fun, but I, I was a poor student. I didn't have any money to do that. So uh, the timing was just right. Uh, Walt had been the designer of the track, laid it out. Uh, Walt was the uh, secretary of, the, of GR Inc. Uh, and Ray was the president. There were a couple other officers that I did not know. Uh, Francis Wyckoff and Robert Shaw and also William Sorensen were the other officers of that group. And their offices were located at 1533 Linden in Des Moines. That's just uh, kind of uh, north of where the new World Mark is in downtown Des Moines now. I think that building is still, still there. So uh, I embarked on this, and as a student, you know, you've got so much to learn, and you, and you still don't know it all at the time. Certainly, when you don't even know it all when you graduate, let alone when you're at the beginning of your fifth year. So there's, to me, there's a lot of na naivety in, the, in what I'm going to show you, but uh, it's a learning process. You have to take the project and, and develop it as thoroughly as you can, so you have to do a lot of research, uh, as much research as you can on the building type, what kinds of functions it needed, inside what might cost uh, you have to design not only the the architectural the look of it but also the, the structure and the, the mechanical electrical kinds of layouts and that sort of thing. so uh, with Walt and Ray's advice uh, I did some interviews I want to tell you a little bit about about that now remember this is in the pre-internet area so it's really it was really hard to find information on race track. It was easy to find information on race cars and sports cars or all kinds of car magazines, but there was uh, very little available on race tracks and the amenities that go with a race track. <coughs> the, uh, the way I, we talked through it with, uh, with Ray's advice and with Law was that uh, they, they thought there should be a clubhouse, and that's what they called it. They wanted to have it actually be a private club uh, where the investors in the stock of the uh, the GR Inc. would be automatic members if they were at a certain level. Uh, gold was uh, $2,500, the silver was $1,500, I think. And then others could buy in up to a maximum membership of uh, 350 people. So that's, that was the parameters in which I began uh, the design process. There also needed to be not just a clubhouse, but there needed to be a judges and timers stand, a pit area, concessions, toilet. They also wanted to um, fill out the use of it and make it a profitable venture so they wanted to have a ski chalet with some skiing over in the, the north area needed a tech inspection center and a gatehouse so the Greenwood Pros prospectus that was dated July 17 1962 stated in part it is contemplated that eventually the roadway facilities will include not only the basic roadway an asphalt paved road for road racing approximately three miles long but will also include a clubhouse with facilities, concession stands, sanitation facilities, communication and press facilities, and pit areas. It is also possible that in the future the development will include a gun club, commercial skiing facilities, golf, and possibly retail sales outlets for various types of equipment usable for roadway. So again, that, that began to form some of the background for what I was asked to do. Uh, <laughs> My research into motor racing, which was part of my thesis, I just found some tidbits in there. Kind of, I've read this thing in 50 years, so this is what it looks like. This is the, this is the thesis. It was before computers, so it had to be typed by, by a typing uh, person that I hired to, to type three copies of this thing. And the state of the art in the graphics, which you'll see up here, wasn't very good. These were uh, 20 by 30 boards, illustration boards, uh, and then we had to uh, have a, a, a photo stack, black and white photo stack, uh, made of those drawings and, and placed in the in the thesis uh, material as a part of the requirement. So the uh, the quality of reproductions is uh, is messy, but you can probably see through it. But some of the things I found interesting in the research are that the first recorded race from Paris to Rouen was in 1894. The early races were typically won with an average speed of 11 and a half miles an hour. The early endurance race had the driver in action for 53 hours straight. The Chicago Times Herald sponsored the first U.S. race in uh, Thanksgiving of 1895. They had 83 cars enter, 
six cars actually raced. They were going. They went 55 miles, eight, eight inches, and an average of seven and a half miles an hour. They raced from Chicago to Milwaukee and back. The winner was Charles Durier's motorized wagon, that was the name of it, and the only other car to finish was the German Benz. Uh, William Vanderbilt Jr. sponsored the Vanderbilt Cup from 1904 to 1916, which became more popular than the World Series. No race was held in 1907, and this was common to several of these races because crowds were so crazy about these cars that they, they crowded in, they were uncontrollable, and there were a lot of accidents and deaths. And that, that caused actually a, a sort of a bubble in racetrack activity where it dropped off again after a decade or so because uh, there was just too much uh, uh, injury going on. But in any case, Vanderbilt built, the, built his private Long Island Motor Parkway at that time and it was open to anybody for a dollar to go and drive around the, this uh, parkway. And finally, the French Grand Prix began in 1906 on closed public roads outside of Le Mans. So when we turn to the uh, considerations of, of design, when you think about this, uh, the things that I had to think about and, and, and show in my thesis were the history of the clubhouse as a cultural institution, a recreation character. What, did, what, you know, what do you want a clubhouse to look like? It's a, it's a leisure kind of activity. You had to also deal with regulations like building codes and zoning and industry standards. Of course, you had to deal uh, with human dimensions and scale. And I, one of the things that I, as an architect, I'm sensitive to, particularly is scale. And I think about uh, the illustration of the game of baseball, for example. What if the what if the home plate or the uh, picture to home plate is what 16 foot six inches or whatever it is? What if it were 90 feet? What if it were 30 feet? It's just there's it's the human scale is so important to architecture as it is to sports, sporting events as well. <laughs> you have to think about the culture and psychology of the motorsport. Uh, you think about the professional and technical aspects of the motor race and the engineering, the design, the support activities. <laughs> think about the uh, functional element, what what it needs, what its clubhouse needs to have in order to function properly. <laughs> think about the site organization, how where you're going to arrange all the elements on the site. So those are all things that began to overwhelm me as a student, I'm sure, but uh, maybe not sure. <laughs> the uh, when I did my notes with uh, my interview with Walt which is undated from fall 1963 and probably actually occurred several times because he was so handy to me there to stop in and chat. But I asked him whether he knew of any existing building type that I should be looking at. He said he doubted that there were any for this clubhouse and, and, and to look at the best points of other clubs. So what part of the research looked at golf clubs and sailing clubs and yacht clubs and other kinds of, of clubs. He said what is needed is, a, is what he called a big barn where cars can be stored at night and huge meals catered during the day and after race banquets. A kitchen wouldn't be needed if it was catered. He said there will be a national SCCA race next year, so that would have been 64. Uh, probably the best location for the house is on the highest ground, uh, approximately in the center of the site. And uh, I'm showing my friend Jerry Manning where that would be as we drove around the, the course this morning. And the club would be private. Uh, and uh, he recommended also that a police headquarters and a driver registration would be near the gate. Then I interviewed uh, Ray Phillips, again undated, but in that fall of 1963. I asked him about an existing building type. He mentioned Meadowdale in Chicago, which was open from 1958 to 1969. He said it had some of the same functions, but not all. Uh, in these days of the internet, I looked into the Meadowdale and, you know, like many racetracks that no longer exist. In fact, there's a lot of racetracks on the internet now that have the, all that's left of them is the web pages that are dedicated to them. The first race occurred almost exactly 50 years ago. It was June 11th and 12th, if I got the right dates. Uh, and I showed the attendance at 13,000, so it was, a, it was a good sized crowd. The second race was September 21st and 22nd of that same year, and 21,000 attended. By comparison, uh, there was a racetrack at Lake Garrett, Kansas, that had attendance of 55,000. Watkins, Watkins Glen had 65,000. Nelkart Lake had races that uh, attendance that varied from 40 to 60,000 at the time. I, had, I remember being there maybe 15 years ago when the governor of Wisconsin was at Elkhart Lake, and he said it was. Uh, 
tennis was like 101,000. He said it was the best sporting event that had ever occurred in Wisconsin at that time. Uh, the desire, and this is still an interview now with Ray, he said the desire to study uh, character is a year-round recreation facility with a rustic atmosphere. The elements that needed to be included in this building was a bar. That was, that was the number one thing he mentioned. Tiny, a minimal office space, 360 degree view, kitchen, concessions, toilets, lockers, and showers, future overnight facilities, question mark. So even envision that it could be a hotel here. Uh, a pagoda, which would have first aid, the judges and timers area, press and race officials, cantilever and starter uh, platform, at least two levels and a communication center. And then the pits, which would just have power, compressed air, water, portable fuel containers, future chalet, chalet at the bottom of the ski run, which would be up on the north end, and a tech inspection building with a hard surface, which he again described as a big barn. The ski trails were laid out. I didn't have copies of this, but they were laid out by John uh, Mahler, a mayor of Mason City Ski Club, including the possibility of a 50 meter ski jump. And there were six events to be take, uh, to occur in 1964 and maybe more. Those included an SCCA National Sports Car Championship in mid-July, a motorcycle national, the second largest in early August, regional sports cars in late May, divisional sports cars in September, stock car national championship in late June, the go-kart national endurance race in mid-June, and a divisional runoff championship in uh, October. The financing for the track came from stock sales, and they have sold uh, about $200,000 of stock at the time that I interviewed Ray, and they expected to close it uh, sales after about $125,000. They had a backup uh, commitment from a small business investment corporation loan of $60,000. I don't know if they ever drew, drew down on that, but they had it as a backup, and that would have been a first mortgage at 7%. Their collateral for that was the chain link fencing, uh, for which the actual value of six thousand, uh, and that was only being credited with five thousand dollars of collateral. The land at one hundred fifty dollars an acre compared to what that is today, three hundred sixteen acres. So that was worth a little over forty-seven thousand in the collateral. Four sheds, two hundred dollars each for eight hundred dollars. I don't know where that came from. So the total collateral was fifty-three thousand, a little over fifty-three thousand. Okay, let's see. So finally, then talk about the design for a little bit. The character was to, uh, in my stated goal, then, was to complement an atmosphere of excitement and glamour while retaining the mood of a private club and its luxury and eliteness. The budget, based on a 350-member uh, private club, was assumed to be $18 a square foot. Now, if you know anything about construction today, uh, you better not start at under uh, $150 a square foot or so. Uh, but that would be, if you converted that to inflation aid, uh, expenses of today, that would be $136 a square foot today. So you can get a, get a feeling for how much uh, change has been in 50 years. The complex uh, would include the clubhouse, pagoda, ski chalet, gate registration house, and tech uh, inspection uh, phase like this. The clubhouse and pagoda would be first and would cost, by my estimate, about $215,000 in $1963. So, multiply that by what not quite 10 so that'd be uh, two million dollars today which is vastly underpriced probably uh, and then the, the second phase within three years would have been the ski chalet the tech inspection center and the gatehouse for another fifty two thousand dollars or so so i think that's most of the notes and i just wanted to run through uh show you real quickly what the the thesis looked like So I'm not going to stay very long in these pages. I know it's hard to see back there. But this, an, ar an architectural student, at least, is uh, is trained to go through what's called a graphic analysis. And this this just takes every space that I have uh, determined was necessary, like a bar and a, and a lounge and toilets and all that kind of stuff. It puts a square footage on it, and then you place that at scale on the site, so you can just get begin to see how much room these spaces take up. Now, if you're going to stack them, it's not going to occupy that much ground space, but it just starts to give you an idea of what's involved. So this, there's a tally here of the uh, the square footage, which I, I can't read, let alone here. And then there's a, a site diagram for the racetrack, the, uh, the uh, 
you can't even read what that says, but this is the general area. We're sitting, uh, let's see, we're a second, I have to get my, okay, this is north to the right here. So we're sitting over this area right here and the clubhouse area would have been out in this high point area here. So inside the, the track, uh, this is a schematic, uh, just the, what's called a flow diagram. How are you gonna relate these spaces? Do you need the kitchen tied to the, to the dining area and, the, and, and so on? And then this was part of the research. This was Riverside Track in uh, in California, Riverside, California, which uh, it seemed like a lot of tracks uh, had about a 10-year life and then went away. So this one, I think, was from about 1958 to 1968. It is now, or at least in further research, it became a shopping mall. It torn down and became a shopping mall. It was interesting to me that right here, you can see where my cursor is moving. This was designated as Grand Prix Club. So while I'm not aware of any racetracks, and maybe there are some that have clubs as such, that was apparently the state of the art of thinking at that time. And the rest of the animated is here, grandstands and, and pits and so on. So this, these are some of the drawings that I did. As I said, these were 20 by 30 illustration boards, and then we had to have those reproduced in this photostat process. So this is kind of an overall area view looking to the, looking to the northeast, really. This would be Highway 65 down at this area we're sitting up in, in this area and the clubhouse is there but you, get, you can't see it because of the murkiness of the uh, reproduction <laughs> and then a, a closer diagram of the uh, of the track with the topography uh, all these lines are uh, actually these are probably these are probably five or ten foot contours uh, so every line represents a, a, a change in elevation of, of ten feet or so so and whenever those lines are close together it's steep so you can see that there's more of a sort of meadow area here and here. It's deeper over in these areas. And this shows then the little side sketches for the pagoda, the gatehouse, uh, the tech inspection, and the sea chalet, which weren't a major part of my uh, design problem. Uh, this is a, a look at the actual uh, five-story uh, clubhouse. Uh, this one is looking to the southwest, so it'd be up uh, on the inside of that ferry looking out this direction to see that building. This is a flow diagram for the site, how you were going to uh, negotiate the site. And uh, you can see that the uh, there would be uh, bridges over the uh, track at various places and different gates to get into the track. Uh, this is a, uh, a closer in uh, site plan of the immediate area of the clubhouse with, uh, with some uh, support parking. Uh, these are pretty murky, but basement, first floor, and second floor of the, uh, of the building, so it has lockers and, and showers down on the floor level. It's mostly open at the main floor level, just the lobby and elevators and stairs. Go up to the second floor, and there's, uh, there's some private dining areas. This is the structural framing across the top and mechanical plans across the bottom. But they are, they're, the architect doesn't really care about a lot of that stuff. He just wants to design it. So you want, you want the engineers to do this stuff, but you have to go through it with the students. Here's the perspective of the five-story building. And there's some more floor plans. This is the third floor, the fourth floor, which you can see the full dining floor, and the fifth floor, which is really a roof with just, just the stairways and the elevators going up to that level. And then these are uh, called elevations, so these are uh, straight on view, so you can see some little people peeking over the parapet here to be able to see the course, um, a delivery area down the, on the lower level, some sections through the, uh, through the building in both directions and a more detailed section. And that's, that's about it. So um, I want to turn that over now to Wayne. Where'd you go, Dwayne? There you are, okay. <laughs> you share your thoughts. I don't know what, what I can add. Really, um, I was about yay high when I Ed was involved in the track. Uh, my parents came from New York, both of them. My father had a letter of acceptance from the University of Colorado on motor design and the University of uh, Iowa State University for architecture. And the story is the car broke down at the point. <laughs> he obviously had an interest in auto for quite a while. Um, again, being 10 years old or so when all this was going down, I'd run around the house, 
play in the yard, notice people coming and going, conversations, a lot of time spent at Phillips' house, Phillips over at our house, playing with the kids or their kids, if they hurt. Um, when I actually came to the track, my father was a racer. Um, I remember I, could, I couldn't go into hot pits, obviously. I was in the paddock, had to find the spot where the top of the snow fencing was broken off so I could see the track. I was given a clipboard and the two stopwatches to uh, the time my father. Um, I don't recall buildings. Uh, I don't recall concession stands, rescue facilities. I know out in the middle of the gravel paddock, there was one little water spigot. It was my job to go fill a bucket of water, take a back seat, and wash the car. Uh, other memories of the track, uh, I remember just being able to watch the start finish straight and then the, the upper section as the guys came out of the S's and headed back down toward the keyhole. Uh, that was a lot of fun, but that was that was the extent of my range uh, without somebody else to walk around the track with. I remember uh, the USRC race saying hello to Mr. Shelby. I remember uh, vivid images of Ken Miles and his Cobra with a big, huge, what looked like sort pipe exhaust. And when he lift to take the left hander to head down the hill, it be a big blast of flame. I saw it's going to melt through a tire. I also remember the motorcycle sidecars. That was uh, quite impressive. And I remember watching over the start finish screen when Ron McConkey's Jaguar was doing pirouettes in the air. Uh, apparently lost at the last corner coming up at the start finish line. And I have seen, there are some photos of the remnants of the car on, uh, I think it's old Nebraska, uh, region website. Um, if you're interested in old tracks, I already had a chance to read it, but there's a fellow that raced when I was racing by the name of Pete Hilton. Uh, out of Indiana who wrote a whole book on ghost tracks, the tracks that used to exist in the 50s, 60s, and has gone away. So that's available. Uh, I don't know if he uh, got an Uber about this event. I tried to email him in a roundabout way, but I don't know. What kind of car did you get? Uh, started out with TR4s. He, he raced some other cars before this track opened, but at this track it was TR4s, then he had the production Speedsman uh, that he got from Gary Stevenson. Oh, there's a copy of those tracks, okay. Uh, so I remember conversations toward the end of the track life about some heavy conversations about paving, repaving, can we do it, can we not, where we get the money. Again, for you know somebody who now is probably 12, 13 years old, that's, uh, that's about the extent of it. I'm sure Dean Elder has more memories, Skip Phillips, or Skip. Okay, yeah. okay. Oh yeah, he does look like a sand. <laughs> <laughs> I skipped a lot more documentation. I moved away fairly early, so I never had those nights sitting around the house. You know, how did this go down? How did that go down? Who were the investors? That's what I got. So, uh, I'll open it up to whoever Eric wants to. Yep. Excuse me, you want to you say oh, a few little bit, please? Hi, I'm Skip Phillips. Uh, actually, legally, I'm Ray Phillips, Jr. Um, I do remember the bathrooms because they had a problem with bathrooms. They were basically kibos that they had built out of tin. And I remember that uh, they were going to put a hole in it so that uh, they vented. Well, the hole was almost a 12-inch hole, and it was low enough that whoever was in it could see out. <laughs> and that was a huge problem. Uh, what was the other facility? Well, actually, and my sister Pam might have memories too, but I can remember when mom and dad bought the land and we ended up on the, uh, that can't be mine, uh, we ended up on the hillside and they showed us where the track was going to be and how all of this thing was going to go together. Uh, there were a couple of concession stands because I got to help build the concession stands. Uh, one concession stand was just south of the farmhouse, if I remember right, and the other concession stand wasn't in inside the center of the track. That's what I was thinking. And then uh, there was just the one bridge that was a pedestrian bridge, but there was two. 
and of course the Kendall Oil one was the most predominant one from the highway and of course there was an old uh, auto bridge that they started out and they bought that from the county and it was crane set into place and then my uh, grandfather uh, helped build all of the signage uh, on that thing. Um, let's see, what are some of the other memories? Well, I brought a little bit of documentation. Um, I have the original land purchase, the original organization, the original corporation, uh, the real estate contract. Apparently when they were going to organize this thing, um, it started out that it was basically a partnership from what I can gather of it. And you know, as a kid, because I was only, well, when they were developing it, it was closer to 1961, so I was only about 11 when they were developing it. And uh, so I didn't get a lot of the details of that, so I'm going through what my dad was going to throw away. I fished it out of the waste basket. Um, but they were going to either sell the land to the corporation or lease the land to the corporation. And I think it ended up with the sale, but I have both of those documents. Um, Paul Schwartz was one of the uh, original people also. And uh, he was mostly in marketing. He was the general manager. Dan was president, Paul was the general manager, uh, Walt was the secretary, uh, treasurer was Augie Kohler, uh, who was a family friend of ours that was an accountant. And, uh, um, you, do you have a list of all the original stockholders? Yes. Yeah. And how much they bought. <laughs> how many went? About how many people? Uh, I think it was probably around 70, 80 people. I didn't bring that with me. I do have a Walcott Kiss's original uh, thumbnail sketch when he did the Judges and Titans stand. Which you would be. I'm over here. Oh, yeah. Um, I had his original thumbnail sketch, which was, which maybe was maybe quite a fun. Maybe what's that? Uh, around, around no, this was oh. the Judges and Titans stand. Oh, okay. The uh, Judges and Titans stand looked. And I have this hanging in my house. It's actually about uh, 18 by 24 in size for the actual drawing. Uh, this was part of the stock offering. Um, and then, of course, um, you're, you had a copy of this, a very good copy of this. My dad, Ray. Uh, drove a TR3 when he raced, and he didn't race too much here, but I can remember uh, going around the track with Shai Fadre, my mom and I, in all three of us in the TR3 together. <laughs> Shai, if you remember right, Shai Fadre was probably 6'3", 6'4", probably weighed 240. So three of us in a little teeny uh, trying TR3 going 120 to 130 around the track was Quite a thrill. <laughs> uh, then there's, I have this copy of the, and it, I thought it was the original board of directors. It turned out to be a meeting at one of the other tracks that they were getting the advice. And then that's a picture of dad that's in the, the programs. Um, this is a picture of dad smiling which is not in any of the programs <laughs> i don't know why they wouldn't smile i also have dad's original business card is a gold card as stockholders and then i have i don't have his stock certificate he sold all of his stock um he left the track in around 65 and he sold all of his stock to shy Fadre for a dollar and took the tax rate off. So I don't know, I don't have any of those forms. I tried to get those from uh, Bruce Fadre, but he didn't have them. I also have all of the grading photos. There's probably about 20 shots of those. And then, uh, of course, all of the um, programs up through the uh, separate September 26th race. 
upgrade. And then I and then I also have which there is a copy here of the original asphalt and grading plan because I have uh, those original documents. Any questions? What shape was the land that you got? It was forest? Or was it farmland? Or was it, it was uh, farmland, mostly this way. Uh, once you got, you know, the hump where there's the other gate off the highway. That was almost like a dividing line. Everything north of that was wooded and swampy. And it's dark and dried up now. And then kind of on the hillside where the hairpin curve is, that was north of it was wooded. The hairpin curve had nothing, no trees or anything on it. Then it was cut down. Where was the Kendall King trying to deserve a picture of that? The Kendall Gate. Uh, um, well, there was a gate. Oh, the bridge? Yeah. The Kendall Bridge was, it wasn't too far south of the main road here. It was probably 100, 200 feet, is that sound right? And I, Pam had remembered, I had forgotten. Dad was uh, also a union block layer, too. And he laid up the, the walls to support the bridge. And the night he laid up, or the, yeah, during the night he laid up one of them, it blew over, so he had to come back the next day to relay that so that they put the uh, bridge on. And originally, I remember they had it where it was just cables, and people could go up on the bridge, and they, they tended to stand on the bridge and watch the rates, which one was a problem with insurance, and two, people couldn't get through, so they covered it with, as, as, uh, with the uh, advertisement board so that it would keep people moving. I mean, it probably was only five, six foot wide, so two people would walk over and get through. Skip, there's a picture of the Kendall Bridge on the website. You can check out greenwoodroadway.com. Thank you. And then there was another advertisement bridge, which was the auto bridge. The other one had to be closed in the or had to be closed in two, I'm sure, but I don't remember what advertising was on it. Any other questions? Do you remember who the uh, major stockholder was? Dad was the biggest one. Okay. He had never did hear that. He had multiple gold cards. And the way it worked, if I remember right, there was a five thousand was the lowest level, five thousand shares of stock. Then a ten thousand, or five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, and twenty-five thousand dollars, and they're five thousand shared stocks, five dollars share stock. And Dad had several gold cars. What was the bridge right? Is that the Kendall Bridge? Yeah, that would be the Kendall Bridge. That was a spectator. Yes. Wasn't that also when you had the, the real fast cars coming up over the hill? They almost got airborne, almost. <clears throat> Boy, I would be real surprised if they could have touched that bridge because it was probably 12 foot, which would you guess 10, 12 foot up? Yeah. And so, and the hill really didn't seem like it was that. Oh, well, I have to admit today, there's some spots that you can make 60 miles an hour on this track today. Because I did. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. My name is Miles Kraus, and uh, Shai Fadre, you mentioned, oh, he yes. became the owner of all this property right. at, at the end of uh, That's right. the, I think, bankruptcy filings or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you a lot about Shai <laughs> if you want, but he owned this in for oh, yeah, 40 for years or probably since about. 70, 68, long in there, up to about five years ago? Yeah, right, about five years ago. Uh, anyway, Shai was the concessionaire at the grandstand at the Iowa State Fair. And uh, lots and lots of stories about Shai. He knew everybody, but he had only a few that he people, that were friends that he really trusted. And uh, he was an investor because of the main concessionaire. He was an exclusive concessionaire. Right? And so he had owned some stock. But when this thing all collapsed, it's my understanding, you correct me, that the original stockholders could not buy it. 
for whatever reason. I, I well, that could be. Yeah. So Shai had an elderly gentleman that he gave a bushel of cash to to uh, buy the, the land, the track. Shai, being concessionaire to Grandstand, all of his business was in cash, and he was the most secretive guy, and uh, I can tell you lots of stories about finding boxes and paper bags of cash in stash to all kinds of places over the years. Shai also was responsible for me becoming a concessionaire at the fair, now on Stockman's Inn at the State Fair, and he owned that with two other guys way back in the very beginning, 69. And, uh, and for some reason, he trusted me, and we became good friends. And he ended up uh, selling me one third, his third at interest in Stockman's after 69, 70, 71. He operated with the other two guys. And I bought out the other two guys, and I'm still there. But anyway, uh, Shai uh, called me up numerous times and came down here with him, A and Dorothy, his wife, and this was his getaway. And his plan was to convert the track and fix it up a little bit and make it a street and sell off parcels of land to wealthy people like doctors and buyers, people like Bill Dykus, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and have them uh, own a piece of the land here, have it a, a housing development, and with the track as the street. And uh, that never materialized. Uh, of course, he didn't have the power to make that happen, but. Uh, they would come down here, and uh, he call, Shai would call me up every year or so over the years, and uh, every couple of years, I want to know if I want to buy this place from him. And uh, he, I said, well, how much you want? He wanted 250000 Now, if you go back to uh, when it went through receivership, uh, the way it was written, the way I understand it, none of the original stockholders could buy it. Shai was one of the original stockholders. So what he did, he gave uh, $40,000 cash to a older gentleman friend of his, and that person went to the courthouse, I guess, I don't know the details, uh, and purchased this property, and then immediately deeded it over to Shai. <laughs> and that's how he became the owner. And uh, they owned it then for four years or so. Uh, as he got older, he, he knew that housing development wasn't going to happen. He just wanted to get out from under it and sell it. One to fifty thousand. That's the only number I've ever ever heard him ask. Never got both. <laughs> anyway, but I think from the original uh, print sale, it looks to me like uh, it went for twenty thousand dollars when Mom and Dad first bought it. Right, right. Yeah, very beginning. Yeah, and before it was a track. Yeah, and that would have yeah. been the uh, the sixteenth of March. Okay. So anyway, that's the uh, that's and, and then until five years ago, but Shy passed away about what three, four years ago? Maybe? Four, five, yeah, uh, probably three. Yeah. And then Kurt, his son Kurt, died. Kurt uh, passed away uh, also. Yeah. So and Bruce is an attorney, his other son in Chicago. And Bruce handled uh, the transaction, I don't know. Uh, I might have been sold to them. Yeah, he doesn't also want to go back to the unfortunate. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Real quick, we got about 15 minutes here before actually the next seminar is going to start, which will be uh, drivers. Uh, so the actual people that have actually raced here. If you guys want to, uh, I know there's still a lot of questions. If you've got, I've seen people have brought in memorabilia. If you want to display it on the table, you're more than welcome to. If you want to grab some food here, uh, I don't want to keep everybody uh, away from uh a hungry stomach here so please if you've got questions we'll all be available up here um, but we'll uh, continue to keep uh, moving forward thank you